Imperium Secundus. With the torrential ruin storm raging, blocking out the light of the Astronomicon and causing warp travel to be all but impossible, the Imperium was effectively cut in half during much of the Horus Heresy following the Battle of Kal. The Dark Angels came to the realization that they were unable to return to Terra to assist in its defense, even with the use of the Tuchulja engine. Miraculously, they did manage to lock onto the beacon of the strange alien device known as the Pharos on the world of Sotha, which guided them safely through the warp and to the realm of Ultramar's capital world of Macridge. There, they were greeted by Robut Giaman and Sanguinius, whose Blood Angel's Legion was also guided to the realm of Ultramar by the same means. The three Primarchs were instrumental in the foundation of the Imperium Secundus as a means of continuing the fight against the traitors and securing the Emperor's great work. Giaman proclaimed Sanguinius as the rightful heir to the Emperor and declared him the new ruler of Imperium Secundus. Lionel Johnson was made the Lord Protector of this new empire of humanity and supreme commander of all of its military forces, a title that was similar to that of War Master. Unfortunately, the foundation of Imperium Secundus was marred when Kurz escaped from the Invincible Reason and rampaged across Macrage, intent on spreading as much terror and chaos as he could. Eventually, both Giaman and the Lion confronted the cornered Kurz. Their attempts to kill him were unsuccessful, however as the Night Lord's Primarch had laid a cunning trap. He brought down an entire chapel upon the two Primarchs through the use of planted explosives and fled the scene. Giaman and the Lion were only saved through the direct intervention of the Loyalist Iron Warriors Warsmith Barabas Dantioch who was communicating with Giaman at the time of the attack through a portal that was opened by the Pharos. On instinct, the warsmith reached through the portal and pulled them to safety on Sotha. The Battle of Zapath Feeling directly responsible for the Night Haunter's rampage on Macridge, the lion continued to obsessively hunt his wayward former brother for the next two Tehran years. In 11M31, he eventually was able to trace a slim lead on Kurz's whereabouts to the Zapath system, which had since fallen to the word bearers and world eaters' forces during their shadow crusade. Farith Redloss, the lieutenant-elect of the Dark Angel's Dread Wing, was charged with leading the hunt for Conrad Kurz upon the world of Zapav. The Dark Angels quickly uncover the horrors perpetrated by the word bearers for their dark rituals on that planet. Eventually, the Dark Angels took part in multiple engagements against the forces of both traitor legions, which culminated in the capital city of Numentis. The traitor forces were utterly annihilated by the victorious Dark Angels, and the world was left in the care of its surviving population. Meanwhile, Another detachment of Dark Angels under Captain Ormond reinforced the Space Wolves against the Alpha Legion of the Alaxus Nebula, while another under Causewain was tasked by the Lion with hunting down Callus Typhon following the Battle of Perditus. 
The Exile of the Lion. While continuing his obsessive hunt for the elusive Night Haunter, the Lion and Giaman continuously clashed over policy, especially in regards to the security of Imperium Secundus. They were particularly vexed with how best to deal with the emergence of rebels on Macridge that the Lion was certain Kurz had instigated. Following a suicide bombing of an Astartes convoy, the Lion used the First Legion to establish martial law on Macridge. Certain that Kurz was hiding within the rebellious Illyrium region, he advocated the use of a massive orbital saturation bombardment of the region to ensure Kurz's death. Facing resistance from both Emperor Sanguinius and Giaman, the Lion instead opted to deploy his legion's Dreadwing in order to flush out Kurz and the rebels. During an attack on the city of Alma Mons, the Lion finally cornered the elusive Night Lord's Primarch and the two came to blows. After a brutal confrontation, the Lion eventually emerged victorious and questioned his brother why he had turned away from the Emperor, to which Kurz simply replied, Why not? Kurz went on to explain that there was a monster in his head that he could not stop. Though he finally had Kurz at his mercy, the lion couldn't bring himself to kill his brother, and instead pummeled him again. He then ripped off Kurz's backpack from his battle plate, lifted him over his head, and brutally brought the Night Haunter down across his knee, breaking his spine and paralyzing him. The lion brought the grievously wounded Conrad Kurz before Sanguinius and Giaman to stand trial. A triumvirate was later held where Kurz defended his actions, but refused to admit his guilt. Since each of the Primarchs had been created to perform a specific function, Kurz argued he was merely acting according to his own nature, and therefore had committed no crimes. The Night Lord's Primarch further divided Giaman and the Lion by accusing the latter of secretly ordering orbital bombardment in direct violation of Giaman's orders to prevent civilian casualties. Enraged, the lion sought to kill Kurz, but was halted by the words of Sanguinius as Giaman snatched L. Johnson's lion sword and broke the blade across his armored thigh in his fury. L. Johnson was furious too, but Sanguinius dismissed the Lord Protector, ending the Triumvirate. The Lion was then banished from Imperium Secundus. Taking his leave, the Dark Angels withdrew from Macridge only hours later. Standing in the chamber of the Tuchulcha engine aboard the Invincible Reason, he brooded over recent events. He questioned his actions over the course of the last few decades, the banishment of Luther, the death of Nemiel, as well as other decisions he had come to regret. As the Dark Angels made their final preparations to depart back to Caliban, he went back to the Tertulcha engine's chamber. He ordered the device to teleport himself and Hulgin Deathbringer, the voted lieutenant of the Deathwing, back to Macridge. As Sanguinius prepared to execute Kurz for his crimes, both the Lion and his lieutenant teleported directly into the chamber and told him to stop. As troops entered the room, demanding the Lion's surrender, L. Johnson explained his reasons for the intrusion. He reasoned, 
that Kurz had the ability to see precognitive visions of potential futures, and repeated the Night Haunter's claim that his death would one day come at the hands of an assassin sent by the Emperor. If this was true, the Lion reasoned, then it was proof that the Emperor was still alive beyond the barrier of the ruined storm. Sanguinius knew the Lion's explanation rang true, as he recognized that his own precognitive visions of his inevitable death would also eventually come to pass. When Guillermin demanded to know what would become of Kurz, the lion knelt before his two brothers and promised that he would be Kurz's jailer. Kurz remained captive aboard the Invincible Reason and occasionally the lion would visit to speak with him in an attempt to gather information from his prophetic visions. But the Night Haunter rarely proved cooperative. The Second Battle of Davin In the wake of these revelations, Imperium Secundus was abolished by the Three Primarchs as an unfortunate mistake. The Three Primarchs led their legions in an attempt to breach the Ruined Storm and reach Tala to defend the Emperor now that they knew he still lived. Once in the Ruined Storm, the combined Loyalist fleet came across a variety of warp-born horrors and word of an entity spreading destruction known as the Pilgrim. Not even the Tuchalcha engine proved capable of navigating the Ruined Storm, which frustrated the Lion. During the Battle of Piran, L. Johnson commanded Dark Angels Astartes as Sanguinius received a vision and realized that he needed to go where the Horus Heresy had truly begun, the world of Davin. Through an arduous journey, they eventually reach Davin, the nexus of the continuing ruined storm in real space, and engaged a vast, demonic host on and above the world in what would be remembered as the Second Battle of Davin. Reluctantly, Robert Guillermin and the Lion agreed to trust in Sanguinius, but both had thought to simply destroy the hated world upon arriving from orbit. After the fleet emerged over Davin, Sanguinius shocked L. Johnson by boarding the Invincible Reason and taking the still captive Conrad Kurz with him. Sanguinius hoped to use Kurz's prophetic abilities to determine what he was meant to do upon Davin that could help to save the Emperor. He commanded a mass ground assault on the world, and the enraged lion nearly ordered that Davin be subjected to an exterminatus action regardless of Sanguinius' presence upon it. At the last moment, L. Johnson relented and was immediately horrified by what he had nearly done. He realized that some external power was attempting to force the Primarchs down the path to damnation, and he followed Sanguinius down to the surface. On that dusty world, Sanguinius was trapped within a portal to the warp and did battle with the demon Madail, while Guillermin and the Lion desperately tried to reach him. A vicious battle erupted both on Davin and above it in the void, where Guillermin's acting flagship, Samothrace, was destroyed in orbit by the demon ship Veritas Ferum. During the ground battle at Davin's infamous Temple of the Serpent Lodge, where Horus had first been corrupted by chaos, Guillermin and L. Johnson managed to finally fight as partners and brothers. Together they brought down a massive, soul-grinder demon engine. 
Eventually, Sanguinius was able to escape, and the Space Marine forces evacuated the world to orbit. Davin was destroyed by cyclonic torpedoes, and with its anchor and real space gone, the demonic fleet vanished back into the Empyrean, and where Davin had once been, a breach in the ruined storm was now visible. The path through led directly to Terra, but upon further study, it became apparent that Horus had foreseen that this route might open for the Loyalists, and had blocked it with a gauntlet of multiple traitor fleets. Guillermann and the Lion agreed to distract the blockade, while Sanguinius and the Blood Angel's fleet made directly for Terra, for that was their destiny. By the time the Siege of Terra began, the Lion hoped to draw traitor forces away from the throne world by striking at their own Legion homeworlds. As a result, the Dark Angels destroyed several traitor homeworlds such as Chemos of the Emperor's Children and Barbarus of the Death Guard, acts that the Lion would come to relish. The Passage of the Angels and the Crusade of Vengeance At some point before or during the Siege of Terra, the Astronomicon went dark for the Dark Angel's fleet. Fearing that Terra had fallen to Horus, L. Johnson became nihilistic, instead of moving towards Terra, pledged himself to vengeance through the destruction of as much of the traitor's territory as he could. Using the rationalization of attacking the traitor homeworlds in hopes of drawing reinforcements away from Terra to his troops, he oversaw the destruction of Camos and Barbarus in a spiteful purge dubbed the Passage of the Angels. Without the Astronomicon, the Dark Angels continued to rely on the Tachalcha engine for guidance through the warp. The Lion eventually ordered the Dark Angels fleet to head to Deliverance, the homeworld of the Raven Guard Legion where Corvus Corax and Lehman Russ of the Space Wolves Legion were currently mustering their forces. The Lion was quick to question Korax's absence from the major fronts of the war, but his wrath was quickly extinguished by Russ, who pointed out that the Space Wolves' own survival was still an asset of great worth, even if Terra remained beyond their reach. Russ declared he would join L. Johnson's so-called Crusade of Vengeance, together with Space Wolves warriors equipped with the new suits of Mark VI Corvus power armor produced on Kiavar. Yet Korax was cautious to commit his badly mauled legion to what he saw as a needlessly spiteful waste of resources for a purely emotional gain, and only assigned a small expeditionary force of the Raven Guard to accompany the Space Wolves and the Dark Angels. Eventually, the Dark Angels made course for Terra on the Lion's command, but arrived too late to influence the outcome of the siege or prevent the Emperor from being mortally wounded by Horus and interred on the Golden Throne. The Return to Caliban L. Johnson, racked with grief over the inability of his Dark Angels to reach Terra in time to prevent the fall of the Emperor during the siege at the end of the Horus Heresy, returned to Caliban soon after the end of the siege for the first time in many standard years to reinforce his Dark Angels and recover from the shock of the Heresy. Caliban had long been cut off from the main body of the Legion, due to the effects of the Ruin Storm and the other tempests that had roiled the Immaterium during the worst days of the Horus Heresy. 
When the Dark Angel's void ships arrived in Calibanite orbit, they were fired upon by a savage salvo of defensive fire from the surface. The fleet pulled back and the lion tried to find out what was happening. He learned from a passing merchant ship that Luther had poisoned the mind of the Space Marine garrison on the world and taken control. It could only be seen by L. Johnson as the taint of chaos once more working its corruption, now upon the soul of his oldest friend and former mentor. The lion's fury was let loose, and the planet suffered. He ordered a systematic orbital bombardment of the planet to rid the world of chaos for all time. The planet burned, and its defenses were whittled down to nothing. Johnson led his forces personally against the defenders who had taken refuge in the Order's fortress monastery. The Lion found Luther and saw him to be completely corrupted by chaos, and almost nothing of his old friend had survived. Luther now a Chaos Champion, had been elevated to a strength equal to that of the Primarch through the Gifts of the Chaos Gods, and the two met in a duel the likes of which would not be seen again. They leveled the monastery around them, but the planet was also taking a heavy toll. The sustained bombardment began to crack the surface of its crust, the dark angels in orbit unable to see the damage they were wreaking upon their own homeworld. The Final Battle The battle between Luther and the Lion was truly titanic, but ended with a psychic attack which appeared to mortally wound L. Johnson. Luther then realized what he had done in his jealousy and anger, as if a veil of deceit had suddenly been lifted from in front of his eyes. He fell to the floor, unwilling to fight any more, but it was too late for L. Johnson. The enraged ruiner's powers of chaos realized they had lost control of yet another of their pawns, and sent a massive warp storm to rack the surface of the planet. It then broke apart under the strain, destroyed all but for the monastery of the Order, which had been protected by potent defensive force fields. The rest of the Dark Angels who had been converted by Luther to the worship of Chaos were sucked into the warp and scattered across the galaxy. From that time forward, they were named the Fallen Angels, or simply the Fallen. The Fallen Angels were scattered throughout space and time, and Caliban tore itself apart under the strain of the Ruiner's power's assault. When the Dark Angels descended to what remained of Caliban, now little more than an asteroid upon which stood the Order's fortress monastery, they searched the ruins and found Luther mumbling that L. Johnson had been taken by the Watchers in the Dark, and would return one day and forgive him for his sins. The Dark Angels could not find any trace of their Primarch.